Hello, this is Robert Jones. I'd like to thank you for joining us for our August seminar. Uh, the first 30 minutes we'll be continuing the course Hell and the Devil in the Bible, the Apocrypha and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, today we are descending into Hell. Get an idea of what that's like uh, in those uh, books. And then uh, at the 30 minute mark, Elder Ed LeCompte will take over with a message for it's called Alone in the Furnace, which I haven't listened to it yet, but I'm suspecting it has something to do with the book of Daniel. We are transmitting to you from a secret location in the extreme northeast corner of Rome, Georgia. Uh, it's not quite as far uh, up uh, Route 53. Uh, it's still within the Rome uh, city limits, uh, but we can't tell you where it is because, uh, as I said, it's a secret. So we have been looking at uh, Hell and the Devil. We've done the section on Satan and his allies, and we're in the section now on Hell, Hades, and Sheol. And we did the Old Testament part, which is focused on Sheol, which is a kind of undefined, shadowy place uh, that one goes when one dies. And it doesn't seem to have much to do whether you were good or bad. It's just where you go when you die. And we only see the Christian vision of what uh, it is like uh, very late in the Old Testament. Our key sources, Old and New Testaments, which uh, we consider authoritative. The Dead Sea Scrolls, which were found in the late uh, 1940s and early 1950s at a place called Qumran uh, in the uh, Judean desert. They often refer to an ultimate battle between the sons of light and the sons of darkness. The latter forces are led by Belial, which is Satan, who is one of the New Testament names for Satan. And here we start to see hell as a place of fire for the damned. So who wrote the Dead Sea Scrolls? Well, we call them Essenes, or the pious ones, the holy ones. Uh, we don't know for sure who they were, but they seem to be kind of a proto-Christian sect that lived out in the desert. Uh, some people think John the Baptist may have been one. Um, we're also looking at the Apocrypha, the set of books uh, that appear in the Catholic Bible between the Old and New Testament. Uh, the Apocrypha uh, in that manifestation is 12 books. There are other uh, Bibles where they are 16 books and they add some additional ones like uh, uh, Second Enoch. Uh, First Enoch is a book that was found in the late 19th century uh, in the Ethiopic uh, because only one, uh, uh, one translation of it had been found. And the fact it was kind of eyeball and it was an Ethiopic for Pete's sakes and who could read Ethiopic. Uh, it was translated into English, but it was pretty much ignored. And then when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered, they found 20 copies of it in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And I would say its, uh, it's importance went up at that point. And then finally, and I think we'll get to it today, we'll talk about what's known as the Christian Apocrypha. Uh, this is the least authoritative of them all. This is a series of books that were written uh, probably 3rd century, 4th century. Uh, that claimed to be, or sh uh, claimed that they should have been part of the New Testament. Uh, they were not. Uh, they were called by Eusebius as uh, impious and absurd. And uh, I won't argue that. The reason we're including these books outside of the Old and New Testament is not because we consider them authoritative, but because it gives us a better idea of what was going on uh, in the Middle East, and especially with Judaism and proto-Christianity at the time. So as I said last time we looked at uh, hell in the Old Testament with Sheol and now we're going to look at it in the New Testament which is a much uh, more unpleasant view of where uh, some people go when they die. A number of re references Matthew, Mark, Luke, uh, refer to the fire of hell. So it's a hot place, but it's also dark. Matthew 10, 28 tells us that both soul and body are destroyed in hell. 
We're told that it's a fiery furnace, and there'll be weeping of gnashing, weeping and gnashing of teeth, which is one of my favorite uh, phrases from the Bible. Matthew 16, 18, the power of hell can't overcome the church, though. We're told hell is a place where the condemned are sent for eternal punishment. Once you go to hell, that's it. You don't get out. There's no second chances. Uh, so you want to make sure that you get into heaven when you die, uh, not into hell. Luke 16, 23 to 26, again, no second chances. You don't get to go back and forth between heaven and hell. The only person that appears might have been able to do that was Jesus. Uh, and that may be the part about, and he descended into hell. Uh, 2 Thessalonians talks about everlasting destruction and separation from God. Uh, some people say that the hell is being separated from God forever. I think that is indeed part of it, but uh, it's not all of it. 2 Peter 2, 4. Angels that sinned are sent to the gloomy dungeons in hell. And notice this. The angels are sent, and this is probably the group of angels that Satan took with him when he fell from heaven. Jude 1, 6. Angels that sinned are kept bound in darkness. And Revelation has a number of references to hell. Uh, Revelation 1, 18, Christ holds power over death and hell. Uh, Revelation 6, 8, death and Hades followed behind him. Uh, also, uh, a line from a famous movie by Clint Eastwood, uh, and, uh, and, and death rode forward and all hell followed behind him. Revelation 9, 1 to 2, the abyss, smoke from a gigantic furnace. So once again, we have the fire and the murkiness. Uh, Revelation 11, 7, the beast or the Antichrist comes from the abyss up to earth, not to heaven. Re Revelation 14, 9 to 11, we're told that uh, they're not just burning, they're tormented with burning sulfur. And several other references in Revelation tell us that the hell is a lake of fire and burning sulfur. Revelation 20, 13, eventually hell will give up its dead for judgment. It's already been predetermined where they will end up. And uh, to hell is where they go. So we see a very different take on hell, I guess you would say, in the New Testament, it's a place uh, the bad go. It's a place people who are not believers in Christ go. It's a place of torment. Uh, it's a place forever. And the people that uh, are in hell will be judged by Christ in the final judgment. So hell and the Apocrypha. So remember the Apocrypha is that set of books, 12 to 16 books, between the end of the Old Testament and the beginning of the New Testament. So the jump from a vaguely defined Sheol in the Old Testament to the well-defined hell of the New Testament, well, it's kind of jarring, unless we examine the theology of the writings of what we call the intertestamental period. And this is supposed to be a period that I know a lot about, uh, and I can talk about it endlessly, and I will fight that urge and keep it brief. One of the books of the Apocrypha is called The Wisdom of Solomon, also in Baruch. Hell, Hades is referred to in almost the same terms as Sheol in the Old Testament. So they're older uh, books in the Apocrypha. Uh, it's a shadowy place that all people go to when they die. So that's kind of a, an ending, if you will, of that Old Testament theology. Wisdom of Solomon, for they uh, reason unsoundly, saying to themselves, short and sorrowful is our life, and there is no remedy when a life comes to its end, and no one has been known to return from Hades. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see for the dead who are in Hades, whose spirit has been taken from their bodies, will not ascribe glory or justice to the Lord. Now, why are they in, in uh, hell? Because they don't ascribe justice to the Lord. But the person who is deeply grieved, who walks... Uh, bowed and feeble with failing eyes and tarnished famished show soul will declare your glory and righteousness O Lord 
In Sirach, though, again, one of the books of the Apocrypha, we start to see Hades described as the end destination for sinners. The way of sinners is paved with smooth stones, but at its end is the pit of Hades, or the pit of hell. Ah, that's starting to sound a bit like uh, the New Testament, especially Revelation. I like the way that it's uh, paved with smooth stones. It's, it's easy to go down that path because, boy, it seem, sure seems like fun. And, uh, God, we don't really believe in that God anyway. And there's no heaven. There's no hell. And those are the smooth stones that you end up in the pit of Hades. And later apocryphal works such as Second Ezra and First Enoch, the view of how Hades is a place of fire and torment for the wicked becomes very prominent, which makes some people think they're proto-Christian books. The idea of a final judgment becomes strongly connected with the idea of hell. Uh, this is Second Ezra, the pit of torment shall appear. Notice the language, the pit of torment. And opposite shall be the place of rest, heaven. The furnace of hell shall be disclosed, and opposite is the paradise of delight. Then the Most High will say to the nations that have been raised from the dead, Look now and understand whom you have denied, whom you have not served, whose commandments you have despised. Look on this side and on that. Here are delight and rest, and there are fire and torments. Thus he will speak to them on the day of judgment. Uh, Pat Robertson, and uh, there's other ones too, he's perhaps the most prominent, uh, always believed that Judgment Day was for sinners only, that uh, those that were safe would not have to go through it. And uh, I realize Second Edgers is not part of the authoritative Old and New Testament, but this seems to go along with that idea. First Enoch, sinners separated when they die and are buried in the earth. Judgment not overtaking them in their lifetime. Here their souls are separated. Moreover abundant is their suffering until the time of the great judgment, the castigation, and the torment of those who eternally ex execrate, whose souls are punished and bound there forever. So the final uh, destination of those who go through judgment day as uh, uh, unrepentant sinners uh, is uh, they're bound into hell forever. It's starting to sound a lot more uh, Christian. And they shall confine those angels who uh, disclosed impiety. And again, we're talking about the angels again, so probably the third of the angels that Satan took with him when he was swept out of heaven. And when all this was affected from the fluid mass of fire and the perturbation, there's a word we don't use much anymore, which troubled them in that place, there arose a strong smell of sulfur, which became mixed with the waters in the valley of the angels, who had been guilty of seduction, burned underneath its soil. Uh, that could, if I had told you that came straight out of the book of Revelation, uh, you, you might be willing to believe it. Because it, it talks about the angels, uh, the fallen angels, uh, the smell of sulfur, uh, burning beneath the soil of hell. Which brings us to the Dead Sea Scrolls and my favorite book of the Dead Sea Scrolls, what's known as the Community Rule today because people, uh, translators and Bible scholars are uh, spoil sports. The guy who first uh, translated it into English, Emil R. Burroughs, called it the Manual of Discipline because he, it reminded him of the Manual of Discipline of the Methodist Church. And I think that's so much cooler than calling it the community rule. But I digress. Be cursed without mercy because of the darkness of your deeds. Be damned in the shadowy place of everlasting fire. Here you kind of have a combination of uh, the old Sheol, i.e. a shadowy place, uh, and, uh, and an everlasting fire. And the visitation of all who walk in this spirit, uh, the spirit of evil, the spirit of darkness, shall be a multitude of plagues by the hand of all the destroying angels, everlasting damnation by the avenging wrath of the fury of God, 
eternal torment and endless disgrace together with a shameful extinction in the fire of the dark regions. <coughs> the times of all their generations shall be spent in a sorrowful mourning and in bitter misery and in calamities of darkness until they are destroyed <coughs> without remnant or survivor. Then there's a wonderful uh, scroll in the Dead Sea Scrolls called The War of the Sons of Light versus the Sons of Darkness. Rise up, rise up, O God of gods. Uh, raise thyself in might, King of kings. May all the sons of darkness scatter before thee. The light of thy greatness shall shine forth on gods and men. Notice that small case, gods. It shall be like a fire burning in dark places of perdition. It shall burn the sinners in the perdition of hell in an eternal blaze in all the eternal seasons. So once again, hell is forever. Hell is a perdition. There's going to be fire there. And once again... It's of eternal seasons. It will just go on forever. Thanksgiving hymn uh, can be viewed uh, as a, a long prayer. And the gates of hell shall open on all the works of vanity. And the doors of the pit shall close on the conceivers of wickedness. And the everlasting bars shall be bolted on all the spirits of naught. Uh, I like Gaza Vermes' uh, translation there. The spirits of naught, or the spirits of nothing. Here's two of the more obscure books of the Dead Sea Scrolls. A Testament of Quahat and Testament of Amram. From your correction, and you will establish yourselves to pronounce the judgment over and to see the faults of all the sinners of the ages, to be cast into the fire and the oceans and into all the cavities for in the generations of truth. The dot 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 and the, and the uh, square brackets are places where there's holes in the manuscript. And then the second one, and on all the sons of darkness will be dark for all the sons of light, and by all their knowledge they will. And the sons of darkness will be burnt, for all folly and wickedness are dark, and all peace and truth are bright. So once again, drawing a, this distinction between the sons of light and the sons of darkness, uh, following along with the theme we saw in the war of the sons of light uh, versus the sons of darkness. So, hell in the Christian Apocrypha. So this would be the <clears throat> the least authoritative of all the sources we're looking at. Uh, again, uh, Eusebius, who put together the first list of what should be in the Bible, he referred to these as impious and absurd. So we're no way uh, attempting to say these are authoritative. Uh, these are books that were probably written 3rd century, 4th century, uh, they really wanted to be in the New Testament, but uh, they were written way too late and didn't fit with the theology of the rest of the New Testament. So I ask a question. Were all the gruesome descriptions of hell, such as the ones that would later appear in Dante's Inferno? And matter of fact, with a lot of us, our, uh, in our minds, our description of hell, with you know, the different levels and, and uh, uh, Cerebus and the boat and all that stuff... That all comes from Dante's Inferno. That comes from a novel by an Italian uh, poet from the 15th century, Dante uh, Alighieri. I pronounced that right? Uh, so where are all those gruesome descriptions? Did Dante just make them up himself, or did he get them from somewhere? So the Christian Apocrypha, they're non-Gnostic works that didn't make the New Testament uh, canon. So I want to stress, these are not Gnostic works. So these were not considered heresy, although they were considered impious and absurd uh, by uh, Eusebius. So the Christian Apocrypha, uh, it's not divinely inspired, it's not authoritative, but once again, they do help us trace the development of Christian thought 
on the subject of health, and probably up to leading to uh, Milton and, and Dante, etc. So probably the uh, best known one is called the Revelation of Peter, not to be confused with uh, First and Second Peter in the New Testament. It's listed in the Moratory Canon from 200 A.D., which basically is like a, a scrap of uh, of an envelope. Envelope, and somebody has written uh, what they thought the books of the New Testament should be on the back of this envelope. Nobody knows who listed them. Nobody knows where it came from. Uh, but it does list the revelation of Peter. So you go, aha, it should have been in the Bible. But then line 69 says that some among us would not have read in church. So it was already controversial at that time. And we should point out that the, the final version of the New Testament uh, didn't come along until 367 when uh, the sainted Bishop Athanasius uh, announced, uh, I, I always loved this, and here are the books of the New Testament. <laughs> and, and they're still the books we use today. Uh, Clement of Alexandria, the Pope, uh, quoted from the Revelation of Peter. It was lost until 1886 when French archaeologists found fragments of it in Egypt. It's probably second century. And it does have some stylish similarities with Second Peter. So out of all the books that didn't make it uh, into the New Testament, this one at least has a little bit of a, a pedigree. I'm, I'm not uh, saying we should include it. But I'm saying people weren't nuts when they said, oh yeah, maybe we should include the Revelation of Peter. The first part describes a tour of heaven given to the apostles by two angels. And the second part is a tour of hell. So this is about as uh, Manichaean as you can get, or in the same book uh, you have uh, uh, a bus tour of heaven and you have a bus tour of hell. And over against that place I saw another squalid, and it was the place of punishment. And those who were punished there and the punishing angels had their raiment dark like the air of the place. That's kind of spooky. And they were, uh, were certain they're hanging by the tongue. And there were blasphemers of the way of righteousness. And under them lay a fire burning and punishing them. There was a great lake full of uh, flaming mire. In which were certain men that pervert righteousness and tormenting angels afflicted them. Well, that starts to sound like uh, Revelation, and it also starts to sound like Dante. So you can see where Dante might have got some of his ideas. And it reminds me of an old joke about the Soviet Union. Uh, somebody took a tour of hell, and they saw uh, Stalin. He was in the, the, the lake of mire, the lake of sulfur. But he was only uh, down to his waist. From his waist up, you, you could see him. And they said, well, how come Stalin isn't, isn't deeper down? And they said, because he's standing on the shoulders of Lenin. <laughs> A little, little anti-Soviet humor there about hell. And you think about it, there's not a lot of those. Also, the revelation of Peter. There were others, women hanged by their hair over that mire that bubbled up. And... Uh, these were they who adorned themselves for adultery, and the men who mingled with them in the defilement of adultery were hanging by the feet and their heads in that mire. And I said, I do not believe that I shall come into this place. And I saw the murderers and those who conspire with them cast into a certain straight place, full of evil snakes, smitten by those beasts, and thus turning to and fro in that punishment. And worms, as, as it were clouds of darkness, afflicted them. And the souls of the murdered stood and looked upon the punishment of those murderers and said, O oh God, thy judgment is just. And this really does remind me of Dante's Inferno. Because you remember he had the, the different rings of hell. And in each ring you found a, a, a different group of sinners. So, uh, that is our discussion for today. Uh, we have a couple more Christian apocryphal books to talk about. And I think uh, the next session we will end 
uh, this particular course and we'll start another one. I haven't decided what it's going to be yet. I'm, I'm leaning towards the top 25 uh, books that influence Christianity uh, over the last 2,000 years, but I haven't decided for sure. So we're going to move to Elder Ed, who has a message for us called Alone in the Furnace. Three, two, one. Hello and wonderful to be back with you again all this uh, summery August. Once again, we see a lot going on in our world uh, since we last got together. Our country continues down the path of de-Christianization at an alarming pace and, and seems content with leaving our best days behind us. Our churches have jumped on the bandwagon, confusing the message of the gospel with some watered-down non-biblical uh, message of social justice or, or worse yet, uh, uh, prosperity gospel. While we attempt to remove theology from society, we see again that it is impossible to do so. Halfway around the world, uh, we have abandoned a society that cries for freedom and, and have left it to a theocracy that oppresses and is openly hostile to Christianity, true Christianity, biblically based Christianity, Christ's holy church, and not, not the watered down self-help, social justice, social club type thing, uh, we're allowing to take hold in this country. We spent a lot of time discussing what true Christian doctrine is here over the last several months and, and what sin is. Uh, and as God has allowed us to return again this month, we'll continue down that road and, and see what is becoming of his church in this country today. Again, we are called to learn these doctrines. We are called to study true biblically based uh, theology and to live the lives afforded to us by those, by those who, who came before us and who shed their blood that we may have access to the word of God, that we, we may have true Christian doctrine available to us so that we should live our lives, uh, lives that are, are, we are called to live that are pleasing uh, to God and beneficial to Christ and his church. Well, with all of that said, uh, I'm once again coming to you almost live uh, from the secret bunker somewhere on the on the North Carolina Piedmont. Uh, truly blessed to get to be back with you again this month. Uh, as always, we are humbled and grateful uh, for God's provision to us, his, his gifts of sustenance, his gift of grace, his gift of salvation through his one and only Son, our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's take a moment now and prepare our hearts and our minds. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you for your many blessings that you share with us every day. We ask that you make your word come alive to us and open our hearts and minds to your true doctrine. Help us to walk in your light, to follow your paths, and to obey your word. Be with those who are persecuted around the world. Deliver them from evil. Lighten the hearts of those who hunt them and oppress them. In Christ's most holy and precious name, we humbly pray. Amen. Our Old Testament uh, lesson today comes to us from the book of Daniel, chapter 3, verses 4 through 29. Many of you will recognize this passage. So may God speak to us today through his holy and inerrant word. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, This is what you are commanded to do, O peoples, nations, and men of every language. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, flutes, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Whoever does not fall down in worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, the flute, zither, lyre, harp, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. At this time, some of the astrologers came forward and denounced the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You have issued a decree, O king, that everyone who hears the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and all kinds of music must fall down and worship the image of gold, and, and that whoever does not fall down and worship will be thrown into a blazing furnace. But there are some Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Sandrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, O king. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. Furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summoned Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, Abed, Abednego, excuse me. So these men were brought before the king, and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you, have, uh, you do not serve my gods or worship the image of gold I have set up? Now when you hear the sound of the horn, 
flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipe, and all kinds of music. If you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what god will be able to rescue you from my hand? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, with the, replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the god we serve is able to save us from it, and he will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. O king, uh, then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual and commanded some of the strongest soldiers in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and throw them into the blazing furnace. So these men wearing their robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And, and these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't these three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, Certainly, O king. He said, Look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High, God, come out here, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the, the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a, a hair on their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defiled the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubber, rubble, for no other God can save in this way. Our gospel lesson today comes to us from the Gospel of John, chapter 7, verses 14 through 18. Here we find Jesus uh, speaking to the Jews in the temple. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true and in him there is no falsehood. Our New Testament lesson today comes to us from the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. Here Paul writes, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word, be ready in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. May God bless this, the reading of his holy, eternal, and inerrant word. Well, you may think from the title of today's message, Alone in the Furnace, that I'm talking about August in, in North Carolina or maybe Georgia. Uh, however, that's not the case. We, we've spent several months now devoted to reviewing what is sound Christian doctrine and what is sin. Uh, we do this for many reasons, but a most glaring example is what has just happened in the complete, swift, and utter collapse of a society under the pressure of an overbearing dictatorial theocracy. And I'm speaking, of course, of the United States and its ongoing submission to the unrelenting and dictatorial demands of secular humanism and abject paganism. 
In our Old Testament reading, and, and, and I have always liked that, that message, that narrative, uh, we have three well-regarded and high-ranking Jews living in a non-Jewish state, and as such are living in, in the world, but are not of the world. This is extremely important to us today as, as we remember that while we listen to, to the religious right around us whine and complain about the de-Christianization of America, uh, and as we have said, it is happening to, in a large part due to a, uh, a dismal effort by most of uh, Christian denominations from Catholics to the Methodists to Presbyterians to the, to the GASP, UCC, to teach anything biblical or even remotely doctrinal, including a, dis, a, a complete disregard for the great confessions of the church, the Westminster Confession, the, the Heidelberg Catechism, the, the Augsburg Confession. In our illiterate state, uh, we are sheep and willing to go along with whatever uh, we hear spewing forth from the pulpit, sadly enough. A dead fish can do nothing but go with the current. Not so with Sadrach, Meshach, and uh, uh, Abednego. Well, when Nebuchadnezzar demanded they worship the giant golden image he created, and it must have been quite a sight, especially with all the, the clanging instruments around it. I always kind of imagined it sounded a little like my, my fourth grade um, uh, uh, marching band class, but uh, they had the courage to stand up to him and, and refuse to worship his gods or the golden idol he created. Do we have that courage today? Let's take a, a look at a moment and think about what our, soci our society uh, demands that we worship today. Society around us uh, demands we worship pretty much anything they can dream up that is counter-Christian. Marriage has been redefined uh, to the detriment of our society and is being redefined yet again to include uh, polyamory. Paganism is worshipped and, and those who fail to fall down and, and worship are ostracized, cancelled by the cancel culture. Uh, of all the things in Genesis, our, our so-called enlightened culture will mock. Uh, who, who thought that Genesis 127 would be among them? Uh, so God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Uh, little King James lingo there for you, for good measure. Our society demands we not only disavow God's word, but basic biology? Whose science are we to believe? Whose truth are we to believe? And why Christianity? Well, with the advent of liberal theology over the past several hundred years, uh, there have been many attempts to redefine what the Bible is in light of the Enlightenment and the belief that the Bible is not and cannot be an authoritative source on history. It is constantly being redefined and re-examined in the sense that it claims uh, its claims cannot possibly be true to the postmodern, post-Christian society, and that many of its claims from Adam to the resurrection are at best exaggerations, and, and it's the feeling, the, the spirit of the Bible that's important and how it makes us feel. Well, Peter answered that pretty, pretty clearly uh, himself in uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21, that reads, for we did not follow cleverly dis, uh, devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice boom from the heavens. For we were with him on the holy mountain, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as a lamp shining in a dark place until the, dawn, the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. End of passage. Very often, the, the basic message of the gospel itself is lost. The message of the gospel isn't a, a New Testament invention, uh, but is given to us throughout the entire Bible. Uh, throughout the Old Testament, uh, in the words of Moses, all the way through Malachi, uh, that salvation is found through faith alone, by grace alone, through Christ alone with the Bible being sufficient unto salvation. 
Nowhere else is salvation found. In no one else is salvation found. In Christianity alone can we find the truth of God's calling to us, and, and in Christianity alone do we find salvation by means of grace rather than by works. We are unable to be good enough to bring about our own uh, reconciliation with God, but God has created a pathway for us to come back to him through his one and only Son, who is fully man and fully human, born of God through a human mother. Both Christianity and Islam are monotheistic religions, but Islam denies the divinity of Christ and, and relies on the self to be good enough to repair our relationship with God. We cannot. A Muslim cannot have any assurance of salvation until the Day of Judgment. The following comment by a Muslim author summarizes the Islamic position accurately. Quote, The entry into Islam constitutes no guarantee of personal justification in the eyes of God. There is nothing in the new uh, there is nothing the new initiate can do which would assure him or her of salvation. Islam denies that a human can attain religious felicity on the basis of faith alone. Only the works and deeds constitute justification in God's eyes. Everyone strives, and some more than others. Religious justification is thus the Muslim's eternal hope, never their complacent certainty, uh, nor for even a fleeting, fleeing moment. Close quote. The Jehovah's Witness claim to be monotheistic as well, but it is most definitely not a branch of Christianity, but rather a cult that, that denies the Trinitarian God. Founded by Charles Russell in 1879, they take the ancient Aryan view that Jesus was created by God and is not God himself, and, and that the Holy Spirit is, is not of his own personhood, but is merely the active force of God. This, of course, is an ancient heresy going back to the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD. Uh, the, the, they deny the atonement and resurrection of Christ. Their Watchtower publication, which used to be published in Brooklyn, uh, much to the chagrin of my father, he was always very upset that, that all the old Gare uh, corrugated uh, manufacturing facilities had been turned over to the Jehovah's Witness and, and were no longer uh, tax-paying entities in the, in the borough of Brooklyn. But um, uh, it, 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 uh, their preaching uh, was for over a hundred years their message of an impending Armageddon, uh, which, to the best of my knowledge, hasn't happened yet. Another non-Christian cult, uh, uh, which many unhappily confuse as, as a branch of Christianity, uh, are the Mormons, or as they prefer being called today, the Church of Jesus Christ and Latter-day Saints. Founded in 1830 by Joseph Smith, it, it boasts an unbelievable 11 million members today. They believe their church is to uh, to be the restored. They believe their church is the restored church of Jesus Christ, and all other churches are apostate. Mormons reject the Trinity and believe that God the Father has a physical body and was once a man and is is now an exalted man and enthroned in heaven, and that there are a plurality of gods. Jesus is not any different from us. The virgin birth is rejected and is believed that Jesus' conception uh, was the result of a physical union between God and, and Mary. Individual salvation is gained by the person in the degree to which they believe and obey the Mormon gospel. It is all on us. They believe the doctrine of atonement teaches that there are, are some serious sins for which the cleansing blood of Christ is not sufficient. And the law of God is that men must have their own blood shed to atone for their sins. The Book of Mormon is translated by Joseph Smith. Uh, was completed in 1829 and is considered authoritative with the Bible being subordinate to it. Uh, any discrepancies between it and the Bible are resolved through use of the Book of Mormon. In short, they believe in the plurality of gods that God created or that God is an exalted man, that man pre-existed creation. So in our, our, our spirit state before we were born, we pre-existed creation. Uh, they believe that the, the fall of man was actually a blessing, that, that some sins are beyond the ability for the blood of Christ to atone, that the church went into to apostasy and, and required restoration, that the, the Aaronic and Melchizedekian priesthoods were restored, that Joseph Smith was a prophet of God and that the restored gospel is Mormonism. 
All of this in strict contradiction to the Bible, to church doctrine, and is heretical and completely incompatible with Christianity. Adding the word Christ to the name of a cult doesn't make it any less cult-like or any, any more Christian, for that matter, as this is the case with the Church of uh, Christ Scientist or the Christian Science. Uh, here we have a very uh, another very non-Christian uh, cult that denies the Trinity along with some other pretty out-there stuff, started by, by Mary Bake, uh, Baker <laughs> Eddy in the uh, mid to late 1800s, she had grown up in New England and had been relatively unhealthy and prone to, to violent spasms and, and a neurotic temper, especially when she, she didn't get her way. She claimed that she discovered the principles of Christian science as the result of a, a, a severe fall on a slippery walk. Her physician, however, downplayed the severity of her injuries. Nevertheless, she was moved to write uh, Science and Health and later added Key to the Scriptures to the title. Uh, this, despite revising it several times, she claimed it to be of divine inspiration. In, 17, in 1879, the Church of Christ Scientist was formed. The cult published its own newspaper, the, the Christian Science Monitor, and, and opened its Christian Science reading rooms, which were heavily censored on what material could be made available, uh, mostly publications uh, that came from the cult itself. The church had lost hundreds of millions of dollars over the years on its periodicals and, and an ill-fated venture into television in the 1990s. The cult is also infamous for its beliefs in healing and, and healing through prayer and its doctrine of, of not using uh, a limited use of doctors and medicine. Although the, the, the using the word Christian in its title is, is decidedly unchristian in its theology, it considers the Bible to be a sufficient guide to eternal life, but only as it is interpreted by Mary Baker Ed, Eddy, and considers it subordinate uh, to the book of Science and Health, which is, of course, the ultimate authority. They believe God a divine a divine mind and and that the mind is all that truly exists and and outwardly rejects the trinity they deny the reality of the body of, of, of they deny the reality of sin and they deny the uh the fall and, and uh, repudiate repudiate man's temporality and finiteness they also deny that the unity of the person of jesus christ uh jesus is present existence, uh, the absolute necessity for Jesus' earthly mission, um, the incarnation of Christ, the virgin birth of Jesus, the, the sinlessness of Jesus, the full deity of Jesus, and, and Jesus' genuine humani humanity. They, they deny all of that. They also reject Jesus' suffering, uh, his death, his physical resurrection, and his ascension into heaven. Uh, they merely believe that salvation from sin comes from ceasing to sin. <laughs> Haven't we all been able to do that? Or when one stops believing that there is such a thing as sin. And I, I think that would be very popular among our, our cancel culture today. I think we see that uh, going on around us. Spiritualism now tends to, to wax and wane over the years and seems to be waxing again with the advent of, of shows on television like, like the Long Island Madam and other such balderdash. Uh, Spiritualism is completely incompatible with Christianity and is quite frankly banned by the Bible. And be careful next time, consider yourself Christian, you decide to go to get your, your tarot cards read or your, your palm read. Um, all types of spiritualism are, are banned by the Bible, and make no mistake, spiritualism is its own religion. Seances, Ouija boards, uh, psychic forces are all part of this religion. Christians uh, look upon it in three ways, as trickery, as psychic force, and as demonic activity. Christianity maintains that the spirits reached in spiritualism are not those of the departed ones you're trying to reach, uh, dear great uncle Fred or, or aunt, aunt Ethel, uh, but rather, um, uh, rather actually demons who impersonate, uh, the dead, uh, people you're trying to reach and in, in, in an attempt to possess those who call upon them. And this is why the Bible strongly condemns spiritism. Now, spiritualists believe in the divinity of Jesus, but they believe in the divinity of all people. They do not consider Jesus any different from anyone else. They also deny any concept of heaven and hell. Uh, 
Uh, Raphael Gasson, a former medium converted to Christianity, writes, quote, we find that spiritual spiritualism is one of the most fiendish of Satan's methods of, of instilling lying deceptions into the minds of people. Having tested the spirits and, and the claims they make through their mediums, we most certainly find them contrary to the word of God, close quote. And J. Stafford Wright, an, an Anglican uh, theologian, once wrote, quote, whatever may be uh, precise rendering of any single passage, it is beyond doubt that the Old Testament bans any attempt to contact the departed. This is true of the law, the historical books, and the prophets. Is there the slightest sign that the New Testament lifts this ban? End quote. Occultism, New Ageism, the rise of Eastern religions in this country can all be considered a failure of us in Christ's church to reach out to these people with the true message of the gospel. As we could, uh, as we cloud the message uh, with our feelings, with social justice, with, with an interest in spiritualism and as a rejection of, of organized religion, uh, we see an obvious failure of the Roman Catholic Church and many Protestant churches to be true followers of Scripture, solo scriptura. We as Christians must assert the claims of Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. The search in life for spiritual fulfillment, for inner peace, for complete satisfaction and joy can all be found in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. You need not go any further. Some cults and false religions speak of reincarnation. Well, when we are in Christ, we have the assurance of a future beyond this life in the next life with Christ. Mary Beck, uh, Baker Eddy is dead. Muhammad is dead. Joseph Smith is dead. Jesus is alive. And Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We are all sinners and we all deserve death. Spiritualism uh, without Christ is death. As Alistair Begg once said, if, if you don't stand for something, you will fall for anything. The Roman Catholic Church itself violates uh, sound doctrine in its inherent idolatry and praying through saints rather than to God and its belief in transubstantiation, the actual physical conversion of the wine during the Eucharist to the blood of Jesus. As Jesus died but once upon the cross at, Cal at Calvary, his blood was shed but once upon the cross for all people and for all time. Now, Protestant churches that uh, have the audacity to put ashes on people's head on Ash Wednesday, which is a direct violation of Jesus' teaching in Matthew 6. And don't get me started on Mariology. Uh, as Jesus himself said in, in Luke chapter 11, verses 27 through 28, uh, as Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. He replied, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. And then there's the whole mother of God thing. She was not the mother of God. Uh, uh, we who use the Bible as a guide uh, understand that she was the mother of Jesus, the man, not the mother of God. Our society did gay brings all things before us as equal. They are not. But as Christians, we, we are to politely listen to our neighbors. But we most definitely do not have to accept uh, their feelings and their beliefs. We have a standard that is beyond our feelings and our emotions. We have God's revelation to us in his holy word. While many in this country, uh, even in the evangelical community, tend to think of our country as the new Israel, we are not. We are, in fact, Babylon. Our paganistic society around us today is, is just like King Nebuchadnezzar uh, demanding we bow down to the pluralistic paganistic society that, that praises debauchery and frowns upon God's word, uh, looking for any opportunity to diminish it. When we stand up for God's word, we will not stand alone. Some say the fourth person in the furnace uh, was a pre-incarnate Christ. However, John Calvin points out uh, in his exposition of da Daniel that Nebuchadnezzar calls, uh, quoting now, Nebuchadnezzar calls him a son of God, not because he thought him to be Christ, but according to the common opinion among all people, uh, that the angels are sons of God since a certain divinity is resplendent upon them, and, and hence they 
call angels generally sons of God. According to this usual custom, Nebuchadnezzar says, the fourth man is like a son of God, for he could not recognize the only begotten son of God, since, uh, as we have already seen, he was blinded by so many depraved errors, close quote. All those around us, both outside and inside the church, having itching ears that will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from, from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. People are sheep. Without proper teaching and instruction, we will follow anything. As Dr. Albert Moeller says, the Bible's understanding of history is not only that everything must have happened as it is revealed as it has happened, but also that it must happen as the scripture says, it will happen, close quote. We are all corrupted by the fall of man and as such do not have the ability to choose what is right when left to our own devices. We must learn and know doctrine. We must be able to defend the faith. And when we stand in the furnace, we will never stand alone. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word, what more can he say than to you he hath said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled? The soul that on Jesus has leaned for repose, I will not, I will not, desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell, should endeavor to, to shake, I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Amen and amen. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we are surrounded by a society that rejects your word and your church. We see evidence of the fallen world's influence on even your church. Because we are not solid in our, in our biblical beliefs and our knowledge of doctrine, we are like sheep easily led astray, and others can lure us with the false promises of false religions and false gospels. Open our eyes, send your Holy Spirit to be with us and guide us on the paths of righteousness for your namesake to lead us back to you. Strengthen us and be with us that we may stand for your word and for your son when we face the furnace of our own paganistic cancel culture. We search for you and for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ only because you have first called us. Let us stand for true doctrine and the true gospel that we may pass it along for the next generations. For it is in your son Jesus' name that we humbly pray. Amen. Well, on behalf of Robert Jones and myself, Ed LeCompte, we'd like to thank you for joining us here again this month. We need to continue to pray for Christ's church's reawakening in this country and to pray for all those persecuted Christians, both at home and abroad, um, that, that all who are, whom are called uh, may come to Christ wherever they are. We need to pray that, that we are all made true believers and not seduced by the temptations of the secular world or, or fall victim to our own thoughts and beliefs or led astray by those who follow false religions and false gospels. We need to pray for all Christians who are silenced by the threats of a growingly intolerant cancel culture who claims tolerance through intolerance. Read the scriptures, read the confessions, read the doctrines, spend time meditating on them and not on yourself, for they know you better than you know yourself. Self-revelation is not found from within, but through meditation on God's word, through the power of Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit. And if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today would be an excellent day to do so, for tomorrow, as we all know, is the devil's day. Until we meet again, may the love of God the Father, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with all believers today and forevermore. Amen and amen. Go in peace. Again, thank you for attending our session this month. In our next session, uh, we will complete the current course, Hell and the Devil, and Ed will have another message for you. Thank you.